you may or may not know that in recent years, the Radha Krishna Letters, we've operated a kind of um, rotation between, they have to be on India, but their classical themes, early modern and then contemporary, was this kind of where the boundary between early modern and contemporary is that discussion for another time, as we may, you may say there isn't that much of a temporal gap between what we had last time and when we have this, this for today. So we're actually, I'm actually thrilled to see that we, this term we've got um, Anita Babiska. She's um, Professor of Environmental Studies and Sociology and Anthropology at Ashoka University. And I like that conjunction very much because, as you probably know, maybe those of you who are not South Asian specialists may not be aware that when Amita is in India, she's a sociologist and she's, you know, as far, as far as Indira Gandhi International Airport. And then when she gets out in Heathrow, she's transmogrified into a social anthropologist. She did her uh, PhD in Cornell and she's also taught at Delhi University and uh, at the Institute of Economic Growth in Delhi. And she's won many, many prizes for her work. I'm sure most of you here know her first book, um, the, the Belly of the River, Tribal Conflicts Over Development in the Narmada Valley, which was a kind of uh, foundational book in environmental anthropology. I mean, it's been inspirational for, for many, many people who've since worked on environmentalism, kind of path-breaking in how clear eyed she was about the internal politics. It probably didn't make her very popular in certain quarters, but um, in, in, in that does, you know, and, and that's nat quite naturally led on to a whole slew of wonderful work on, on caste, on class, on mass-produced food, and most recently on the COVID-19 pandemic. And for us, she's going to be talking about, as you can see, India's urban climate, and I suppose you know, nothing could be more topical right now. The first lecture is about heat, and friends in South Asia know it's pretty hot there right now. <laughs> I'm mean, over to you. We very much look forward. We will. There will be there will be time for questions afterwards. Quite how much time we'll see when the time comes. And uh, but if, if you don't get a chance to ask a question today, please come back on Thursday. And we'll certainly get time to ask it then. Welcome. David, can I move between the? Oh, let's yeah. Let me, we'll have the screen with your. So yes. Let's get rid of. We'll get rid of. Yes. There. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be invited to deliver the Radha Krishnan Memorial Lectures, and. I'm very grateful to All Souls College and in particular David Gellner for this invitation. What I present here today is part of ongoing research based on extended interviews and participant observation. And in this work, I draw on a broad analytical frame, combining a political ecology approach with an anthropology of the senses. Um, this recent work has also been influenced by Anna Singh's notion of entanglement. Uh, entanglements created by the interdependence between different species, different kinds of people with their histories um, and their relationships with the non-living world. As I said, this is work in progress and like all such work will benefit from your questions your comments and your criticism. We live in the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch in which human actions have profoundly changed the earth, its ecosystems and its climate. I'm calling it the Anthropocene, but it might be more accurate to call it the Capitalocene, the Plantationocene. There are other terms that we can discuss and debate. But for the moment, let me use the term Anthropocene as one that was first proposed for this particular era. Much of this profound change on the earth and its atmosphere, um, and much of the change in climate in particular, has been caused by global warming, as greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, synthetic fluorinated gases 
accumulate in the atmosphere and trap heat. Since industrialization started, but most especially since the great acceleration, that period of um, rapid industrial, uh, industrial growth since the 1950s, the increasing rate of burning coal and petroleum and oil and natural gas has made the planet hotter. Warmer air, oceans, and lands together create longer and hotter uh, heat waves, more frequent droughts and wildfires, heavier rainfall, and more powerful storms. These severe forces of weather what we call the elements, heat, wind, cold, and rain, have always been with us. Think of Ernest Shackleton on his expedition to the Antarctic, facing the full fury of the elements. Think of sailors on the sea, braving the elements. Material and yet immaterial, the elements stretch our understanding of how the world is in process, what shapes us and how we shape uh, other things. It stretches our analysis of stable environments, climate as a backdrop, so-called ag agroclimatic zones, against which people live and work and have their being. Much more than mere weather, the elements suggest agency and power, powerful forces, extreme forces that must be endured. And it is that agency as it works with and against humans, other living beings and non-living elements that is the subject of my lectures. How are the elements experienced by different people? How have these experiences changed with global warming? And what do these changes tell us about how people imagine themselves and how they live their lives? This is a vast topic, and I shall explore only a thin sliver of it, and that is urban North India, especially the metropolis of Delhi, where I live. Each place is particular, and these great global forces may affect them all, but in ways that are distinctively local and conjunctural, tangled in specific histories and geographies. So I do not attempt to generalize, but I do hope that you may find evidence and arguments and connections that resonate with other places and peoples. This is also a topic for urgent public action. We need much more investigation and analysis and mobilization, especially on the ground among the most vulnerable social groups. Analysis and mobilization that speaks truth to power. Of course we do. But in these lectures, I shall set aside the question of what is to be done and mm -hmm. instead focus on what was, what is, and how people make sense of it. And with these caveats, I begin my first lecture on heat. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Shakespeare's sonnet was in our school book, but our schoolgirl minds struggled to make sense of these lines. Lovely, temperate, a summer's day? No way. The summer's days we knew in the 1980s in Delhi had a hard glare to them. From May to July, heat rained down from the sky and the earth skewed it back. That baking heat would be briefly broken by an andhi, a dust storm, whipping through swirling dust and bringing a spatter of rain. But the next day, the heat would again be back. Thank heavens for summer holidays when families would retreat to hometowns and villages. Some of my Punjabi friends would holiday in hill stations set up by the English, Shimla, Nainital, and Masuri. But if you couldn't escape, summer had to be suffered and endured, and there was nothing lovely about it. Yet 
looking back on summer as it used to be, a surprising number of older people that I talked to said how much they enjoyed it. There were special summer treats, mangoes and melons and lychees and these slender cucumbers called kakadi. There were summer drinks, mango panna, jaljeera, bel ka sharbat, and of course, the much beloved of many people's roots. There was a feel of ice sliding down your throat. There were summer smells, fragrant cusps or vetiver mats that hung on doors and windows and were sprayed with water, creating dim perfume rooms. The wet earth scent of water from a surahi or a clay pot. People remembered how the courtyard or the rooftop terrace would be washed each evening with buckets of water and the charpais or string, string beds and mattresses laid out for sleeping under the night sky. Everyone together, children giggling and playing, desultory domestic talk between the grown-ups, everyone slowly sliding into sleep. Yes, it was hot but there was no point in complaining. You just had to deal with it. And dealing with the heat meant adopting specific micro practices. Waking up earlier to take advantage of the cooler hours, retiring indoors in the afternoon for a snooze, wearing loose cotton clothes, open slippers and sandals on your feet, Twice a day, eating light food, drinking a lot of water. Common sense, really. But underlying these taken for granted techniques for staying cool was an elaborately worked out theory of the body as needing to be in harmony with its environment. Ancient principles from Ayurveda and Yunani medicine organized how the body and its external ecology should be balanced. Food was classified in terms of its gun or qualities, rajasic or rich and aristocratic, sattvic or pure and wholesome, tamasic or rotten or spoiling. It was, food was also categorized in terms of its physiological effects, whether it was heating or cooling. In terms of its effects on an individual's humors, with the vayu or kak or bile, wind, and phlegm. And finally, food was also categorized in terms of its sensory colors, ras or taste. Fund eight had to take into account temperament and character, place and season. So summer foods and summer practices. If I may be allowed two small footnotes here. <clears throat> First, what is often left unsaid about this classificatory system is how it naturalizes the caste system. People who are forced to eat tamasic food, rotting meats, stale rotis, Dalits who can't afford the sattvic glories of ghee but must survive on the leavings and leftovers of upper caste patrons, are treated in the system as inherently suited by virtue of their character to such a diet. Second, the idea of heating foods and cooling foods is not necessarily about temperature in the physically measurable sense of Celsius or Fahrenheit. For example, there's a belief that drinking lassi is cooling, but drinking beer is heating. So, the idea of heating and cooling um, applies also to the idea of sexual heat. Hence the injunctions that widows should not eat meat, but warriors should. So heat here is part of a much larger flow of energies um, and not just to do with the physically measurable temperature of things. But what I want to draw your attention to here is the underlying idea of a person as intrinsically and 
inextricably linked to her environment, always open to its influences, needing to attune herself to climate, to flora and fauna, to soil and water, what is called Hava Pani, staying healthy in body and mind by following the rules and savoring the rasa or the flavor of the season. <coughs> and it was a season. It had its finite time. It would end when the rains arrived in July. You just had to wait it out. And while you did, there were small pleasures to beguile you. The golden shower of Amalta's trees in flower in May, the flamboyant blaze of the roadside Gulmohar tree. But to my mind, the keenest pleasures were the smallest ones. Come home all grimy and sticky after a journey in a crowd on a crowded bus and having a bath and that first mug of water on one's head, pure bliss. And even for those who slopped in the sun, head covered to ward off the dreaded loom or the hot winds from the desert that swept the city in the afternoons, even those who worked could sneak a short respite in the shade. Listens on building sites, rickshaw pullers, the postman labored on a moist gumcha or towel around their heads. Or we manage, we are tough. Is bhatti me pak chuke. We've been baked hard in this oven to live and work in the heat and to make light of it was to show mastery over one's body, disciplining the mind to rise above material discomfort, to make a virtue of necessity. And it is for a season and a season always ends. Those summers are now gone. The new summers start in March, not May. They create new records in the intensity and extent of heat, in how hot it gets and how long it stays hot. We say that each year is hotter than before, that there are new heat waves, periods of prolonged unbroken high temperatures. However, and this is what surprised me, climate scientists do not attribute the frequency of such heat waves, these extended rises in maximum temperatures to climate change. Instead, they point out that in Delhi, the full blast of solar radiation and warming from greenhouse gases has been moderated by, of all things, the cloud of air pollution that sits above Delhi. We would be even hotter were it not for the insulating effects of our own emissions. And I shall discuss these emissions in greater detail in the next lecture on, on dust. What we do have instead are two other effects. One, there's been a rise in summer minimum temperatures. So Delhi's nights are warmer. People toss and turn on their beds, sweating and sticky. They wake up feeling unrested, groggy and sluggish and irritable. Two, relative humidity in May has increased strongly since the 1970s, in large part because Delhi is well watered. And as we always say to each other, it's not the heat that's killing me, it's the humidity. And humidity can literally kill. In extreme heat, the body cools itself down by sweating. And dry heat allows sweat to evaporate and cools the body. But when the air is itself gravid with moisture, it cannot evaporate sweat and cool the body. And that's when the chance of getting a heat stroke goes up. Your temperature rises, you feel dizzy and confused, you have a blinding headache and nausea, 
your heart is racing in a desperate attempt to cool a uh, to to cool your body a heat stroke if untreated can quickly damage your brain heart kidneys and muscles the elderly with their frailer organs and systems are most at risk as we know from the devastating heat wave that killed more than 70000 people in europe in the summer of 2003 in india the people most at risk are not only the elderly but those who work outdoors for long hours who are malnourished and weak to start with think of the construction worker she has had only a cup of tea at daybreak she is nursing an infant and she must load and carry bricks on her head up and down a makeshift staircase in the blazing sun the sari pallu or the gamcha draped draped over her head provides scant protection and no matter how used she is to heat how toughened her body to endure the elements this is too much this is more than what one can bear another side note almost everyone i spoke to noted that delhi had become hotter but almost no one including even highly educated people an engineer a dental surgeon a professor of literature attributed that rising heat to global warming instead they identified proximate causes delhi was more populous more crowded more congested it was more built up there were fewer trees now it was more polluted in effect they were describing what has been called the urban heat island effect and while all these factors the crowding the density of buildings um the rising population rise in the number of cars all of these factors do contribute to the immediate sense of heat but it was startling to me that almost no one related their experience of heat to cumulative emissions from years of capitalist industry the back to humidity for almost a century fans and coolers were the chief means for actively cooling spaces and i use the term active cooling to distinguish these technologies from what are, what what is called passive cooling or architectural devices such as the use of screens or jalis thick earthen walls verandas and ventilators above doors active cooling in the form of what are called desert coolers is has been extremely popular coolers work by throwing moist air into a room and evaporation brings the temperature down they are easy to assemble and afford but rising humidity makes coolers useless then the only technology that can cool a space is air conditioning and this is where climate change in delhi once again converges with the city's growth narrative since the 1990s in the last 30 years since the indian economy was liberalized Delhi has grown massively in terms of its spread and its population from all over north india and elsewhere people have migrated to the city in search of work better education and opportunities their incomes have risen but the rise has been far greater for already well off sections economic inequalities are larger than ever before what unites people though is the shared aspiration for an improved quality of life though the term can mean vastly different things to a corporate executive quality of life means a holiday abroad to a migrant worker it means a secure place of one's own one of the measures of how much lives have improved is the ownership of consumer durables in fact that's how most survey um people who are doing surveys judge the income group to which household belongs by asking them if they have a bicycle or a motorcycle a television set mobile phone etc and thanks to liberalization 
the cost of domestic appliances, what are called white goods, and, and private vehicles has fallen relative to middle class incomes. For the lower middle classes, um, consumer loans now make it possible to spend on what would otherwise have been big ticket items beyond their reach. At the same time, increased investment in power generation infrastructure, and I won't go here into the entire political economy of coal, the destruction of Adivasi or indigenous communities, the devastation of forests, the pollution at the point of production, the enriching of big corporate firms at public expense, that set of links is rendered invisible, buried somewhere along with the power lines, not even a spectral presence, when we press the remote button to switch the AC on. Let me just say here that Delhi now has more reliable, uninterrupted power. That's coming from somewhere. Most people don't particularly care where it's coming from as long as it's available. And this uninterrupted power has been crucial to the spread of refrigeration technologies. In Mike Levian's ethnography of an urbanizing village on the outskirts of Jaipur, some high caste landowners managed to become wealthy land brokers. From being farmers, they became successful speculators in land. And fellow villagers, admiring, envious, would sum up their upward mobility by saying, Deko ji, wo to AC mein baithe hai. Look, now he's sitting in an AC. That's the good life, to spend the day not toiling in the field, but sitting in an air-conditioned room. For a number of other people, however, an AC is not just a symbol of having arrived, the ultimate luxury. An AC is necessary to how we live, work, and travel in the city. That's because air conditioning works in tandem with other technologies, enabling certain built forms and lifestyles such that one cannot have one without the other. It all goes together, a certain kind of house, a certain kind of workplace, the ways in which we commute, um, all of them depend on the AC. So take housing, for example. Uh, the best example of colonial tropical architecture is the Latin's bungalow, beautifully adapted to the climate, but occupying space in a supremely privileged way. Who other than ministers, judges, and top bureaucrats get to live in these, uh, amidst these spread out lawns, with these large verandas on, on both sides, and um, with excellent ventilation all around. There is the older vernacular architecture of Mughal built Shah Janabad, densely shaded, low rise buildings where communal courtyards and rooftops afford access to cooling breeze. But these kinds of bungalows and these rooftop barsatis are not for most people. The one BHK is. One BHK is real estate parlance for one bedroom, hall, and kitchen. That's the hope that the lower middle class can hope to own. That's a home that the lower middle class can hope to own. A tiny flat in a multi storied apartment block. What in the old city would be called a kabutar khana, a place where pigeons live. And that BHK dream house is actually an unventilated box with no usable open spaces. It would be impossible to live in without an AC. So also with workplaces, instead of buildings adapted to the local climate, there is increasing standardization of building materials, techniques, and designs across the world. An architecture of steel and glass and concrete materials that signal modernity, but that also absorb 
much more heat. And in these offices, labor workers who cannot function without air conditioning. That air conditioning promotes productivity explains why Singapore was an early promoter of its use. Lee Kuan Yew, its long-serving prime minister who propelled the island to prosperity, said air conditioning was the most important, air conditioning was a most important invention for us, perhaps one of the signal inventions of history. It changed the nature of civilization by making development possible in the tropics. Without air conditioning, you can only work in the cool early morning hours or at dusk. The first thing I did upon becoming prime minister was to install air conditioners in buildings where the civil service worked. This was key to public efficiency, unquote. So combined with the notion of the productive citizen, then is the deeper colonial idea about forms of embodied civilization and the degenerative effects of living somewhere. An air conditioned office lets you inhabit a professional style, which means Western clothes, business suits and clothes shoes for men and women. Bodies are groomed to a standardized Western aesthetic and no one sweats and there is no body odor. To reach this air conditioned office, one must travel. And there again, an AC inserts itself as a necessity. If you're in a car, you're basically traveling in a metal box on tarmac that radiates heat, surrounded by the reflective glare of glass and metal, breathing exhaust fumes. What do you do but roll up the windows, switch on the AC, and join everyone else in heating up the planet? Even as more and more people spend longer in air-conditioned spaces, and of course this is profoundly skewed by income and occupation, there are many who are ambivalent about it and who are even critical. Older people especially says, said that an AC creates an unnatural coolness. Many old and middle-aged complained about sleeping with the AC, making their joints pain. They got coughs and colds. They said prolonged exposure would make you fall sick. To go in and out of air-conditioned spaces was to experience two seasons, summer and winter, in the same day, and the body could not cope. Many people also pointed out that air conditioning has an insidious effect. Exposure to air conditioning recalibrated your internal thermostat. Temperatures that were tolerable earlier now felt uncomfortable. Like the internet, air conditioning becomes so much a part of life once you have experienced it that you can't imagine life without it. There's no going back. And when you don't have it, you actively and acutely feel its absence as a lack, something that is missing in life. Some people feel wary about such dependence. Many, of course, limit their AC use because it's expensive. So a lot of people will switch the AC on only for, say, a couple of hours in the evening before they fall asleep, just to let the room cool down enough so that they can fall asleep and then that, that's it. Uh, very few people use the AC in and out all through the day and night. But several people also limit their AC use because they don't want to always be sequestered from the heat. They want to feel that they can still deal with it, that their bodies and minds are disciplined enough to deal with the elements and prevail over them, that there is a rightness they feel to experiencing a season and adapting to it. For a younger generation that has grown up with ACs, 
either a lot or you only sometimes when using, say, the Delhi Metro or when going to shopping malls or, and, and so on. For this younger generation, there is no such ambivalence about the technology. It's what they want, not only to be productive, but for being social, for relaxing with family and friends. So increasingly, aspiring uh, the, the kinds of sociality that people aspire towards are more and more placed indoors, leaving the streets and other public places more segregated than ever. What is it like then outside the cool confines of air conditioned spaces? Well, it's a lot hotter because ACs throw out heat, blasting hot air outside and making it hotter for everyone else. And as this picture shows, not only do you have ACs, but the green box at the bottom is a diesel generator. So if there's a power cut, then the generator kicks in and that's releasing even more fumes um, into, the, uh, into the air all around. ACs have also contributed to global warming, not only because they run on fossil fuels, but because they use specific chemicals. First prion that depleted the ozone layer and then HFCs whose global warming potential can be hundreds to thousands of times more than that of carbon dioxide. And finally, ACs make life hotter by, as I said earlier, having redefined people's sense of thermal comfort. The social experience of heat stands redistributed. As more and more people extend their use of ACs and others aspire to do so, the demand for power is reaching new heights. And the specter of power breakdowns is truly frightening. Even as there's growing political pressure to generate more power, most of it from burning coal. Um, and you know, part of the reason why we can't use solar power to power ACs is that uh, peak power demand for cooling happens in the early evening and, uh, and you know, the early part of the night. Um, and solar power so far cannot be stored in ways that would allow it to be available for that peak load. So pressure to generate more power, most of it from burning coal. Um, but as there are these shortages, there are power cuts and the inevitably target poorer neighborhoods first, even though people who live there don't consume that much, as much electricity as the well-off ones. This, in fact, is what happened in Chicago during the horrific heat wave of 1995, which led to disproportionate deaths among poor elderly African-Americans. Social vulnerability mapped onto the city's spatial geography. And now imagine a night in July in Delhi, temperatures above 30 degrees Celsius, 60% humidity, mosquitoes whining around your ears, and not even a fan or a whiff of breeze to relieve the heat if there's a power cut. In seeking cool comfort, the well-off and those who want to live like that are warming the planet as well as their fellow city dwellers. I will conclude with this pair of images from colonial India. The Mame Sahib at her ease in her airy chamber. The scrawny chested Panka or fan puller outside, laboring to pull that, that, that ceiling fan, laboring to keep the Mame Sahib cool. We who use ACs are in fact much like that meme side, kept cool by extracting services from other people and places, even as we make life less livable for others. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Sharing. Now we do have plenty of time for questions if people would like to ask them. So first. So while, while people are uh, gathering their thoughts, I mean, you referred to uh, Ayurvedic or whatever we want to call it, a sort of humoral balance theory, which is so deeply embedded in popular culture in South Asia. That must be, is, is, do you feel, are you implying that that is as powerful and as strongly embedded among all generations as it ever was? Would you say that it's actually there is a tension with kind of other, other notions um, of bodily well being or nutrition? Or you see that as, you see it as something that's being chipped away at, or is it, as, is, do you think, just as, embedded, just as committed to that view? Bodily balance is the ever were. Right. Should I start so from here? Yeah. Yes. Right. Well, uh, I'm always surprised by how widespread these beliefs are, even though people may not necessarily be able to frame them in terms of a coherent Ayurvedic theory. But this notion of heating foods, cooling foods, um, is is there all kinds of, of ways. Uh, you're right that it's primarily uh, most prevalent among older people, but uh, it still does persist. Uh, in terms of how it interacts with more sort of Western scientific explanations, um, that's a complicated question because very often people uh, will defend these these practices by citing. Um, Western principles that seem to corroborate these beliefs, even though the underlying principles could be completely different. So, for instance, the idea that um, strong medicine, which is how people think about uh, or that's about Western medicine, is is heating, and therefore should be avoided, is now um, thought of. Is, is now explained in terms of the way in which we know that antibiotics affect gut flora and that a uh, microbial life within you is much more important for health. So people go, oh, see, we were right all along. Um, so also for ideas about, uh, about how fertilizers heat up the soil, synthetic fertilizers, that is, and the notion that food that's been grown in um, in in, uh, in in soils which have been fertilized by, say, urea, uh, is food that's not very good for you because the soil has been, quote-unquote, burnt. And um, there are now new studies which show that, in fact, uh, the nutrition that you get from, say, produce which has been grown in um, soils which have been fertilized by synthetic fertilizers, in fact, the nutritional quality is much lower, especially in terms of micronutrients. So people use Western science to validate their beliefs. But uh, I think overall among younger people, these beliefs are tending to dwindle 